Hello, everyone, and welcome to Data Center Efficiency 101, What Sustainability Managers Should Know. My name is Gabriela Bocio, and I am the Communications and Education Manager at Second Nature. This webinar is sponsored by Energy Star and hosted by Second Nature in partnership with Alter Action Inc. Today, we're going to start off with a short introduction into Second Nature and our main program, the American College and University President's Climate Commitment, followed by a presentation from Mike Walker, president of Alter Action. Alter Action is an Energy Star technical support contractor. At the end, we'll have 20 minutes for questions and answers. Um, please remember that you can submit questions for this Q&A at any time using the questions function on your GoToWebinar panel. This webinar will be recorded, and the recording and the slides will be shared in the days following this presentation. Next slide, please. Many of you already know Second Nature and they, you know the work that we do, but for those of you who don't, Second Nature is a Boston-based nonprofit and our mission is to build a sustainable and positive global future by working with leadership networks in higher education. So what does this mean? For example, our signature program, the ACUPCC for short, is a network of nearly 700 institutions whose presidents have committed publicly to eliminating net greenhouse gas emissions and embedding sustainability into their operations and curriculum. For anyone who would like more information on this program and how to become a part of this leadership group, which spans all 50 states, please contact me using the email on screen or visit our websites, secondnature.org and acupcc.org. And now I'll leave you with Mike Walker from Alter Action. All right, thank you, Gabriella, and thank you, Second Nature. Um, I think it probably makes sense to begin with a quick explanation of how Alter Action and Energy Star are related. So um, we work on behalf of Energy Star. We're technical support contractors to the program. Uh, how did we get uh, uh, tangled up in this business of IT energy efficiency? Really three areas of expertise that we bring to the table. Large-scale behavior change programs are our expertise. We've done a lot with IT management and consulting. And uh, we do a, a uh, probably 80% of our work has to do with energy efficiency and sustainability. So uh, it was a good fit for us. Um, we've been working with the Energy Star program now going on 15 years or 14 years, I believe. So we are not here to sell anything. We, we have to, under the terms of our contract with Energy Star, be vendor, product, and solution neutral. And you're going to hear me talk about a number of services that you can take advantage of. They are free. We get paid by EPA, Energy Star, to offer them. Uh, so again, we're not, we're not making a sales pitch here. We, we just want to save, help organizations uh, and schools nationally save energy. So what's the opportunity? Um, data centers consume a tremendous amount of electricity, and we'll get into why in a little bit. Um, that electricity consumption was growing really, really fast. It's leveled off slightly in recent years thanks to widespread energy efficiency measures. Um, it's, data centers still consume about 2% of the electricity generated in the United States, which is a tremendous amount of power, if you can imagine. Um, and the good news is that these data centers can be made far more efficient. And we, we know from experience that efficient data centers can use up to 80% less power than standard data centers. So let's talk for a minute about the difference between server rooms and closets and data centers. You may be thinking, um, that, well, you know, we, we don't really have a big data center. We have a lot of little server rooms and closets. And, and the point of this slide is just to point out that it, it doesn't matter. In a typical office building, a server room or closet can account for 23% of annual energy costs, and if you're in a high efficiency building, um, it can be up to half of the annual, annual energy costs. So this is a major opportunity both for, for organizations with smaller server rooms and server closets uh, as it is for data center, uh, you know, the, the managers of large data centers. So why is it that these savings are still something we're talking about? And, and it's a good question. Um, data center savings remain untapped for the following reasons. Basically, split incentives arise because data center managers have a capital budget that covers equipment costs, but they typically don't pay the utility bills, and in some facilities, 
a completely different part of the organization pays the utility bill. Sometimes we're introducing the, the data center manager to the person that pays the utility bills for the first time. So as a result, when um, it comes to purchasing equipment, energy efficiency is, is not always uh, factored into the purchase decision. So in addition, let's, for a minute we'll talk about risk aversion. An IT manager's principal responsibility is what we call system uptime and system reliability. Uh, any initiative whose principal objective is not to enhance reliability or uptime can be regarded as an unnecessary risk, and, and we have to do some education to, to sometimes to convince data center managers that uh, energy efficiency and data center management best practices go together. That is, in fact, the case. Um, and last but not least, uh, data center energy efficiency measures do involve some special expertise, and the fact is that most IT uh, professionals, they don't receive training on energy efficiency. It's just not really part of their training uh, curriculum. Uh, that, that, begin, that is beginning to change, we hope, um, but, but that is the legacy that we're uh, contending with. So uh, I mentioned these barriers, but the good news is you can overcome this with a little bit of help, and I'm going to hopefully convince you of that fact by the end of today. So what, what are we going to do today? I'm going to walk you through you know, what, it, what it is about data centers that makes them major energy consumers. And then we're going to walk through some, uh, some fairly detailed but non-technical energy efficiency measures. And we're going to cover all of the most commonly used ways to save energy in the data center. You do not need any technical background to follow this. If you've worked a computer before, hopefully this will, this will um, be at a level that, that you find agreeable. Um, our goal here is to give you the power to walk into a facility, a data center or a, a sustain, pardon me, a uh, server closet or similar, and ask intelligent questions. You know, look, uh, look around, spot potential opportunities, and then we're going to tell you what to do once you've spotted some of those opportunities with some next steps and some helpful resources. So not long ago, um, we were approached by Industrial Light and Magic. They're the, the Hollywood special effects studio. Um, and we were able to get some very interesting and telling data from them. They replaced a bunch of older servers with seven racks of new blade servers. And the new racks are equipped with you know, these, these blade servers. And what you, the only thing you need to know about blade servers is that they're very dense in terms of their power consumption. They, a lot of computing power fits on a small footprint with them. Um, just one rack of these blade servers uses about 28 kilowatts. That requires eight tons of cooling. To put that in perspective, it's about equivalent to two uh, average size homes. Uh, that's how much cooling is needed for one rack. And each rack generates heat equivalent to four spirit Weber gas grills. Um, so there's enough waste heat to have a cookout here, quite a cookout, close to 300 burgers an hour. All of that waste heat has to be uh, uh, dealt with. It has to be removed from the data center or you risk equipment overheating and breaking down. So that's why when you look at this, uh, this pie chart here, where does all the energy go for data centers with multiple distributed AC units? By the way, a, a crack unit is a computer room AC unit. Um, as you can see, most of the electricity there goes to heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, which is what HVAC stands for. It gets a little better in terms of energy uh, consumption if you use a centralized air handling system. Then um, HVAC and air movement accounts for roughly a quarter of the energy in a data center. Of course, this can vary widely from center to center, but suffice it to say, um, most of the energy in the data center goes to cooling. And uh, after that, it's the computer loads themselves. And then we'll talk about what a UPS is later. So enough about why the energy consumption in a data center is so high. Let's get into ways to save energy. So we're going to walk through um, three distinct buckets. I, I just find it useful to think of three areas where you can save energy in the data center. And the first is with the IT equipment itself. Now let me explain why that 
is important. Um, it has to do with what we call the cascade effect. And, and essentially the cascade effect just says that if you save a watt of power at the server level, which is in the upper left here, um, that one watt of savings multiplies throughout the data center because infrastructure that you need in the data center to support that server becomes unnecessary. So you save a watt at the server level, you save often as much as three watts or more in the data center as a whole because you need less cooling, less uh, power distribution uh, uh, equipment, less um, power conversion equipment. Uh, so it's really important to focus on the efficiency of the IT equipment itself. First thing you can do is, it sounds kind of silly, but eliminate unused servers and systems. So th th this sounds a bit counterintuitive. Why would there be unused servers or systems in a data center? Well, we know from surveys that often about 10% of the servers in a data center are performing no useful function, but they're sitting there running, pulling energy out of the wall anyway. So well, how can this be? Well, in IT management, we become really good at provisioning. Um, what that means is uh, when the boss uh, asks for some servers for his latest IT initiative, we get on it. <laughs> but we're not so good at removing servers once their useful life is ended because it's just not urgent. Um, so what's the solution here? It's, it's simple, but it is the, the first step is to take an inventory. It's easy to lose track of servers as time goes by. Mergers and acquisitions take place, or people that procure servers may leave the organization. Um, so it's important to keep an, an up-to-date inventory. And um, once you identify servers that are no longer performing uh, useful work for the organization, they can be removed. And the, the economic implications are pretty profound. Uh, one server can save around $2,500 a year in energy, software licensing, and maintenance costs. And um, you can remember this uh, as the Monty Python bring out your dead um, energy efficiency measure. So second, let's talk about consolidating lightly used servers. What do I mean by this? Well. We used to believe in data center manager that in data center management that for every workload you had in a data center, you needed a server. What that led to was a whole lot of servers in the data center running at a fraction of their capability. And the way we talk about that is utilization. So the typical server in a data center runs at less than 6% utilization. We can be smarter than that, and, and there's four basic ways. One is we can combine similar apps onto a single server operating system. So an example of that would be you may have a separate file server for each group in your business unit. That may not be necessary. It may be possible to securely combine them onto one server. Um, you can also reduce redundancy by clustering servers. What the heck does that mean? So Redundancy refers to having servers that can take over when the primary server goes down. And the idea is that you don't want any interruption in your data processing, so you don't have any interruptions in your business. So you will have, a, we used to have a one-to-one -one relationship between the primary server and its redundant failover server. Well, we've learned that it's possible to have one failover server for a cluster of primary servers. So it's no longer necessary to have a one-to-one -one relationship. Downsizing the application portfolio just refers to the idea that you may be running applications that you no longer need. Maybe you're running an old version of Visio or WordPerfect or something silly like that. Um, it's taking up a server somewhere. Nobody uses the application. That's where a um, inventory comes in handy. And it allows you to ask those types of questions. And, and then last but not least, server virtualization. And that is a really important concept, so I'm going to spend a, a bit of time on it. So you may have heard of server virtualization, or you may have heard of the term virtual machine. So what the heck is it? Um, it's a way of combining a bunch of separate servers onto one piece of hardware. Um, and as this diagram indicates, it's a, it's a way of taking lots of different types of uh, workloads and putting them on one machine. It's made possible by software 
that simulates both both the hardware and the operating system of a server, and it allows you to run multiple hardware and operating system simulations on that one box. So this has a ton of benefits, and, and uh, arguably the energy savings is 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 just one and maybe a secondary one because it allows you to scale up and scale down very quickly in a data center. Um, that reduces downtime, allows you to deploy servers much more quickly. Um, but of course, there are definitely energy benefits, and and it basically can cut energy consumption by 10 to 40 percent in a data center because you just don't need as much equipment. So as a result, this is pretty ubiquitous. We see this in most large data centers, but we don't see it in every small data center yet. So this may be an opportunity if you have small data centers. I'll, I won't get into the details. We can in the Q&A if you're interested, but there are some workload applications where virtualization probably isn't the right thing to do. Um, it has to do with the um, input and output requirements that certain applications need. Um, but um, with that warning, I'll just say that server virtualization is huge. It, it can help you save quite a bit of energy, and it's very cost effective, as, as this little case study shows. So this is Southwestern Illinois College. They did a, a nifty little study where they had 35 physical servers, and they looked at the cost of uh, replacing those with, I believe it was, um, four virtual machines. Uh, so they transferred all of the workloads on those 35 physical servers to four virtual machines and then looked at the cost implications. And the upshot was um, about $150,000 in direct costs um, that, that um, those are costs that they incurred for virtualization software uh, and, so, and some other basically equipment. But then um, they achieved benefits of about 100, you know what, I just misspoke. Um, that was the savings associated with using less uh, hardware and less software, about $150,000. And then the indirect costs, power and cooling savings, amounted to about 130000 so the upshot was close to $280,000 uh, savings over three years. Um, and this is just a, a small data center with 35 physical servers, so big, big savings. So moving on, um, again, we're, we're talking about ways to save energy in the data center with the IT equipment. Um, before we talk about right-sizing new servers, we just want to underscore the point that it's important to fully utilize what you've already deployed in the way of servers. And we talked a little bit about that in terms of um, combining server loads. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, in terms of right-sizing new servers, the idea is you don't want to oversize uh, the server for the workload. Don't buy a tour bus when the workload calls for a golf cart. You might be wondering, well, how, why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem because traditionally um, data center managers like to have one specified server that they would buy for everything. And that specific type of server had to be able to handle any workload they threw at it. It made a lot of sense from the perspective that it was easier to manage a data center if you had all mostly the same type of equipment in it. But we live in a world now where most data centers have all sorts of different types of equipment made by all sorts of different uh, manufacturers. And if you're still buying sort of, you know, at any given time just one particular type of server, you're probably oversizing it. You're buying something that is more powerful than the average workload would need. You don't want to do that. You want to buy a, a uh, you want to look at the workload and buy a server that meets that workload and, and doesn't exceed it. Otherwise, you're paying an energy pen penalty for that. We do a lot of data storage in organizations now. Um, think, you know, just for one example, uh, think about all the data that's collected on uh, e-commerce sites, where people click, what they click on, those sorts of things. Think about all the, the emails that we archive and so forth. So this data has to be stored, and generally um, you can save energy with smaller drive platters, lower disk drive speeds, um, but you really get into uh, savings when you start looking at some, uh, some specific technologies, one of which is called a MAID system or a massive array of idle disk. What is this? It's a storage system 
that doesn't expend energy to spin hard disks until you actually ask for the data on those drives. So it maintains power to a, a management module. It only spins up the disks when you ask for data that it knows exists on that particular disk. So this is a great way to save a lot of energy um, with data that you don't need instant access to. Another good way to save energy is with solid state storage. So what is that? It's very similar to a flash drive, only on a much larger scale. There are no mechanical parts to move, so it's really energy efficient. Um, but you know there are good candidates for moving to, to solid state storage and bad candidates. Uh, we can get into that during the Q&A if you're interested. Um, it gets a little bit complicated, and solid state storage, I should note, are, they're generally more expensive than hard drives. But uh, again, a good way to save energy if, if that is a, uh, an objective. And last but not least, you know, tape. Most uh, data centers are replacing tape storage. Um, I'm not sure they're taking into uh, consideration the energy costs. When you store data on tape, um, it does not use any energy uh, in storage. So that, that is something that you want to consider before you decide um, to go ahead and replace tape. And similar to the conversation about servers, you want to make sure you right size all the storage hardware. So continuing down our list of ways to save energy with IT equipment, there's something called data storage resource management tools or storage resource management SRM tools. And these, are, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what these are. Um, deduplication software. This removes duplicate files stored on servers across an enterprise. So you can imagine an example with, with this PowerPoint presentation. Um, you know, I could email this to some of my colleagues. They would store a copy on their hard drive. They might store a copy on their email. Um, pretty soon, there are many, many copies of this same large PowerPoint file all across our organization. And this deduplication software sees that, removes the duplicate files from the servers, and replaces all but one of them with a hyperlink. So it can dramatically cut down on the amount of data you need to store. Less data storage means you need less equipment, means you save a lot of energy. Um, some of these things about provisioning, it, it's simply a way to, to aggregate all of the little bits of storage across your data center. And then through algorithms, predict how much you're going to need and make that available just in time so that you're not operating storage centers for data that you're probably not going to fill up for a year or more. So you can, um, you can bring storage capacity online just when you need it. And then tiered storage, that refers to, to um, designating different storage with uh, different data with different um, uh, importance, I guess is the, is the right way to think of it. So, um, for instance, data that uh, might be first tier data needs to be instantly accessed. You might use a technology there that's maybe a little more uh, energy intensive, but for data that you um, designate as less urgent that people don't need to access immediately, that can be stored on more energy efficient technologies that may require you know, a few seconds more to access. So moving on in our whirlwind tour here, um, I did mention an, uh, a, a UPS system, and I, I mentioned that I would explain what that is. It's essentially a battery system, and it powers a data center or a server room in the event that utility power gets knocked out, which does happen periodically. And you may be familiar with this concept since UPS systems are also available for desktop computers and peripherals, and in fact, that's what you see. Uh, the, the little box at the top of this page is a desktop UPS system. The one, the picture below that shows a bunch of lead acid batteries uh, in gray, uh, and they are controlled by the orange uh, control systems. Together, these make up a UPS system. So in addition to providing power just long enough for emergency generators to come online, these also correct for power surges and, and distortions in the source of power that could damage uh, sensitive electronic equipment. So there's really just a couple things you need to know about UPS uh, systems and energy efficiency. One is if you increase the load factor, you operate in a more efficient range. So what do I, you know, what does that mean? So 
it, it, it means that it's better to have smaller, modular UPS systems that run at uh, close to their capacity rather than have larger UPS systems that may be running uh, at, at just a fraction of their capacity. Um, in addition, the additional, uh, the smaller systems give you some protection um, from system failure because they, they allow, they give you redundancy. So if you have uh, just two UPS systems and one of them fails, you can be in trouble. If you have four um, and one of them fails, it really wouldn't impact your operations. So last but not least, how can you save energy with the equipment? Um, it, it look for the Energy Star. So we're, we're talking about UPS systems here. So here's a Energy Star qualified UPS system. There's a bunch of different types available. What's pictured here is one of my favorites. It's, it's called a modular UPS. And it essentially allows you to stay at that most efficient part of the load uh, curve because you can add capacity just as you need it and kind of operate at that uh, fully utilized range of that, that curve I showed you earlier. Um, all Energy Star UPS makers or, or uh, products that are made by leading manufacturers, so you know it bears the Energy Star, but it, you can find it with pretty much any uh, manufacturer. And while we're talking about Energy Star uh, data center equipment, know that servers can be Energy Star. Um, UPS systems we just talked about and storage systems can be Energy Star and we're uh, working on a, a specification for large networking equipment as well. So what does it mean to be Energy Star qualified in the data center? I'm going to give you one example. Here's an Energy Star server compared to a typical three to four year old server. Um, the Energy Star server uses less than half the power and delivers more uh, processing power in the bargain. So uh, major difference in terms of energy savings by moving to newer Energy Star servers. So how are servers made energy efficient? Um, you know, basically they have more efficient power supplies. They idle and draw very little power when they're uh, not actively uh, running computations. And they, they publish their efficiency uh, rating tool test results. What that allows an engineer to do is look at which server has the best energy efficiency characteristics and performance characteristics for the load they're going to put on it. Um, and a few other things that, that we talked about when we were talking about um, uh, storage efficiency. And just like UPS systems, servers are made by you know, all the leading manufacturers, Energy Star servers are. So that concludes the first part um, about energy efficiency and the IT equipment. And maybe I'll pause for a minute here and just ask um, if Gabriella has received any questions I could answer before we move into airflow management and or HVAC adjustments. Yeah, Mike, I actually have a couple questions here that we can um, address right now. The first one I have is, how can you motivate IT managers to care about energy efficiency of unmetered data centers? Oh, great question. Oh, great question. And what, what, I actually have a session where I address that. Gary, Gary, there we go. That's better. There we go. That's better. I'm getting an echo when I'm I talk. getting an echo when I talk. Do you still hear it? I, I do. You. You. <laughs> I think when your microphone's on, the, the, I get the echo. So uh, anyway, that's better. I'm going to spend a few minutes at the end of this presentation talking about exactly that. How do you get your IT uh, colleagues on board, given all of the challenges that I described at the beginning of the presentation? Did you have a second question? Yeah. Um, so another question that we have here is, what partnership opportunities and incentives are available to help us green our data center? Okay, another good question. It turns out that a lot of these measures that I'm going to describe or have already described, you can actually get help paying for them from your local utility. Uh, I'm going to show you a slide later that has a list of utilities that offer these, these measures, but it's by no means complete. And what I recommend is that 
anytime you're thinking about making energy efficiency changes or, or improvements to a data center or a server room or server closet, your first stop after talking to your IT manager is to talk to um, your utility representative about incentives that may be available. So let's talk about um, the idea of airflow management in a data center. And, and basically, we're just talking about, when we talk about airflow management, it's about getting cold cooling air to the fronts of servers where that air is drawn in and then exhausted as hot air out the back. And that's how servers are cooled. So when we talk about airflow management, it's all about getting cold air to the servers and hot exhaust air from the servers. One of the most efficient ways to do that is what we is is by using what we call a raised floor environment, and the way it works is the AC units pump the cold air underneath the floor, and it's at sufficient pressure to then rise up into the aisles into the fronts of the servers um, through what we call perforated tiles. So you'll see that the guy standing on the left is actually standing on perforated tiles. That allows that cold air to rise up. Um, because it's under pressure, flow into the server um, openings, and it gets exhausted out the back, and then that hot air is uh, returns along the ceiling to the AC unit. So it turns out that the way you orient servers can make a big difference because it allows you, if you orient servers facing each other, you can create a hot aisle and a cold aisle. So the cold aisle is the aisle where server fronts are facing each other, and that's where you want your perforated tiles. So the cold air will be forced to rise up into that quote-unquote cold aisle, get sucked into the servers on either side of that aisle, cools off the equipment, and then the next aisle over receives the exhaust air. It rises and returns to the AC unit. So this dramatically reduces the amount of hot air and cold air mixing, which makes things much more efficient. And you can take this to the next level with something called containment. And in its simplest iteration, containment is simply these plastic, they look for all the world like shower curtains that hang down just below the top of the ceiling. And they just separate that cold air from the hot exhaust air. Um, when you have the cold air isolated like that and it's not mixing, mixing with the exhaust air, it can do more efficient cooling, which means you need to you need to run the AC unit less. That's one way to think about it. So some more airflow management strategies. Um, we talked about the hot aisle, cold aisle layout. Um, you can take the containment thing to the next level with the, what these are called are rigid plexiglass enclosures. So they're even better than those shower curtains that I showed you because they really isolate the cold air and, and contain it and make sure that all of that cold air, instead of mixing with hot air, goes to cool those servers. We'll talk about variable speed fan drives in a minute. Um, we talked about the under uh, the uh, the raised flooring. It's important to make sure that, that there's adequate space under there for cold air to flow properly and that there's adequate pressure under there and no major obstruction so the air can flow. Um, and then those perforated tiles and diffusers need to be placed in the right places in the cold aisle so that that cold air is directed to where it's needed most. You want to seal around the server racks between the racks and the floor so that you don't have cold air escaping from the subflooring and not doing any good. Uh, you want all the cold air that's coming up from the flooring to cool servers. And I'll show you, the, the, I mentioned grommets here, we'll show you that in more detail in the next couple of slides. And then you want to make sure that there's sufficient space, you know, a foot or two at least uh, above the server rack so hot air can rise and return to the AC units. So what you didn't see pictured there is, is um, a great device called a blanking panel. And this basically, again, maintaining the separation of hot and cold air in a server rack. Here's what a rack looks like before you use blanking panels. You'll notice this is several openings. That just basically just they're, they're just uh, where the rack is not filled. So in other words, there's empty spaces there for more servers, but you don't want to leave those empty spaces open like that because then cold air just flows right through the rack and mixes with the hot air and it's inefficient. So what do blanking panels do? They cover those openings and that forces all of the cold air to go through used servers, in other words, servers that are running, and cool them. 
And this is a very inexpensive way to save energy in a data center. A single 12-inch panel can save 1 to 2% uh, per rack in terms of the, uh, the cooling or the energy use. So you can imagine using these throughout your data center can, could achieve a pretty substantial return. I mentioned grommets. Here's a closer look at them. Again, the idea with these things is just to seal around things like cabling uh, and server racks that, that meet the uh, floor so that cold air isn't escaping from the subflooring and doing no good. Airflow management um, cabling, uh, we call it structured cabling, is important as well. So when I mean, you look at this, uh, it's not particularly appealing uh, if, you, if you like uh, clean cables, obviously, but it has a you know, uh, another negative side impact aside from aesthetics, and that is that hot air can get trapped underneath the, underneath the uh, mass of cables, and hot spots can develop. Um, so you want a structured cabling system that looks more like this. It allows plenty of room for hot exhaust air to leave the backs of those servers uh, cleanly and efficiently. So here's a quick case study. We worked with a company called QTS. They have one of the, the largest data centers in the world. Um, so they took us up on some of these recommendations. They removed obstructions to vented tiles, so, you know, things like uh, big coils of cabling that were getting in the way of uh, the, the vented or opened tiles. They closed vented tiles that maybe weren't in cold aisles. Maybe they were someplace where they weren't going to do any good. Um, they installed some of those grommets I showed you. They used some, some um, shrink wrap, essentially, to seal other gaps around doors and pipes. Two months saw $60,000 worth of energy savings. Granted, this was a really big data center, um, but you know their annual estimated savings approaches $400,000 for this measure. Um, so the point here is that this is a major opportunity in a lot of data centers. And you know, to put that in perspective, um, they did a ton of stuff to save energy in their data center. This very simple step delivered about 20% of the total savings. So I promised to talk about variable speed fan drive. So what is this? Well, inside, inside a standard AC unit or computer room AC unit, that's what CRAC stands for, um, you know, the fans are either on or off. If the thermostat hits its set point, then the fans are going to go on and they're going to run at full blast until no cold cooling is needed. The thermostat uh, lowers to the, the set point and then they turn off. Well, so the problem with that is um, it doesn't allow for just a little bit of cooling if only a little bit of cooling is needed. So variable speed fan drives allow the fan speed to adjust proportionally to the demand for cold air and because fans are such a significant share of a data center's energy consumption, making the fans more efficient really helps lower power use. Um, a little bit of physics here. The, the fan pump uh, power varies with the cube of speed. So to, to translate that, if you lower a fan speed to one half of its full speed, it uses one eighth of the power. So this is a major opportunity to save energy. Um, and all of those airflow measures that I showed you previously really uh, kind of come into their full uh, potential only when you have variable speed fan drives. So there are some considerations. Um, these tend to be, the first one tends to be uh, a non-issue in uh, most computer room AC units now. They tend to to be uh, retrofittable, if you will, with variable speed drives, but it's important to notice, note that you, know, you, you, you can have side effects that you want to watch out for. The problem on the bottom is a more real problem, but it's really easily mitigated. So um, variable speed fan drives can affect the power quality in a data center through harmonics, and I'm not smart enough to explain <laughs> really how that works. Um, suffice it to say that it affects the power quality you may need to invest in what are called harmonic mitigating transformers. And uh, this little uh, uh, cost penny here shows you that even with that necessary investment, these are a real good investment in general, variable speed, uh, variable speed fan drives. This basically shows you um, 
the payback, if you uh, look at variable speed fan drives and the transformers, it's about 2.6 years. With the incentive that was provided by the utility in this case, the payback was one and a half years, 1.6 years. So even if you have to go with the transformers, this is still a really good investment. So let's talk about HVAC adjustments, and I'm just going to plow through here, and I want to give us at least 10 minutes for questions. Uh, so HVAC, again, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. If you walk into your data center and you find it noticeably much colder than the rest of the building, chances are pretty good that you can save energy with some heating, ventilation, and air conditioning adjustments. Fifteen years ago, you'd walk into a data center and you would put on a coat. And that's because we thought servers need to, needed to operate at much lower temperatures than it turns out they really need. So the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, ASHRAE as it's called, um, has recommended increasing the inlet temperatures, which refers to the temperature at the front of a, of a server, from what we used to say, which was 64 degrees, to 81 degrees. So. Um, you know, unfortunately, what we see is a lot of data centers are still operating in the real cold range. For every one degree Fahrenheit that you're able to increase the server inlet temperature, or think of it this way, increase the uh, thermostat uh, temperature, you can see three to five percent uh, energy savings. So this is a big one. Um, it's true also that today's servers can stand a much higher uh, operating uh, temperature. And these are just a few examples. So a lot of this equipment is perfectly comfortable up into the 90s and even higher. So again, you may be overcooling your data center. Here's the consideration. You don't want hotspots to develop. So what are hotspots? These are places, you know, in, in server racks or near server racks where this particular spot is just not quite getting enough cool air. And this is, uh, we're seeing this through an infrared photograph, and this hotspot is developed at the bottom of a rack of servers. So what this indicates is more cold air is needed uh, in that particular location. So you have to watch out for these things. You don't want to raise, or pardon me, to, to lower the temperature. Let me say that again. You don't want to raise the temperature in a data center to the point where a bunch of these hotspots develop and you risk equipment failure. You also don't want to raise the temperature in the data center so high that the server's internal cooling fans automatically turn on. You can imagine the impact if every server in your data center suddenly turned on its internal cooling fan. Uh, that would really increase the amount of energy consumed in that data center, and that's not a very efficient way to, to, uh, to cool servers. So you want to and get the temperature to just below the level when those fans are going to kick on, which may require a little experimentation. Uh, so let's talk for a minute about humidity. Um, it's analogous to the temperature thing. We used to think um, that uh, humidity needed to be tightly controlled. So why do we care about humidity? Well, if it's too damp in a data center, you'll worry about moisture condensing on metal components inside servers, which can lead to shorts and equipment failure. If the humidity is too low, you worry about static electricity, and you worry about static electricity discharging and damaging sensitive equipment. So um, we now know that it's not necessary to really tightly control humidity, and there are standards around this. Um, what tends to happen if you have really tight controls on humidity is you have one AC unit that reads the humidity as too high, so it overcools the air to remove the moisture, and then it heats it back up again to, to bring the temperature back to the correct range. Meanwhile, computer room AC unit number two across the room sees the relativity, uh, uh, the um, relative humidity is too low suddenly, so it adds moisture by generating steam, and that is really inefficient. Uh, and then it has to cool the air back uh, to bring the temperature down. So we, we, there's actually a term for this it's called crack fighting, computer room AC fighting. So the way around this twofold, one is um, don't use dew point as your humidity measure. Use relative humidity, pardon me, don't use relative humidity, use dew point instead. I can get into that in the Q&A if you're interested. Um, you can maintain a broader range of humidity 
And if you do have to do humidification, you want to use humidification technologies that are energy efficient. And uh, those include misters, foggers, and ultrasonic humidic humidification uh, technologies, not steam producing humidification technologies. And th this stuff is so, uh, so much more energy efficient than producing steam that it's actually required in California data centers in new construction. And to show you what a difference um, there is between steam humidification and ultrasonic humidification, you can see this uh, case study again from eBay, you know, uh, even without incentives from the, uh, the uh, local utility, the payback was less than two years to replace all of their steam humidifiers with new ultrasonic units. Um, and then, uh, you know, with the incentives, it was six months payback. Uh, so one of the downsides of ultrasonic humidifiers is that you have to have to use deionized water, but it's not a big deal. Um, you know, there are systems that can do that for you. They don't appreciably add to the cost. So uh, free cooling. So there are things called water side economizers and air side economizers. And essentially what these do is they pass the heated air through a um, a cooling tower to chill the water rather than passing it through a mechanical chiller. So essentially you're using the outside cool air to cool down your data center. So you can imagine that the energy savings here because you're not mechanically cooling. So uh, I talked about water. The air side essentially just brings in outside air when conditions are right uh, to cool the data center and exhaust hot air uh, back into the real world. So in some climates, like San Francisco, um, outside air, you can use it for most of the year. In San Francisco, it's all but about 10 days annually that you can use outside air to cool the data center. Um, what's surprising to me is that it's not just San Francisco. Even if you look at this map, what this shows you is even in places like North Florida, half of the year, in terms of uh, you know total hours in a year, half of the year you can use an airside economizer. How is that possible? Well, think about nighttime. Think about winter. Um, those are times of the year, uh, times of the day where you can use airside economizers and take advantage of the external air temperatures to cool your data center rather than mechanically cooling air. So I'm going to wrap things up with a couple of resources. One is if you want more information on any of these opportunities or all of these opportunities, um, you can get non-technical descriptions of them uh, at the Energy Star uh, website. We give you impartial information about costs and savings, some of the implementation considerations. I want to reiterate something that came up in one of the questions. Utilities often help you pay for energy saving measures, but you have to talk to them first. If they find out that you're already implementing some of these measures, you are no longer eligible for their incentives. So you want to talk to them first before you get started. Um, the Energy Star rating for data centers is something you should know about as well. It's, it's essentially a way to compare your data center to others across the U.S. And if you are in the top 25 percent of your peers, you are designated as an Energy Star data center. Um, that's terrific, but it's a great tool if all you do is compare uh, your data center to others in the U.S. And that allows you to perhaps identify areas for improvement. So I promised to talk about how to proceed or how not to proceed with uh, your IT uh, team. So a lot of IT energy efficiency uh, projects do kind of derail. And the reason for that is you really need an IT expert on your side. Um, it's very easy for a data center manager who has all sorts of demands on their time, uh, a lot of pressure to keep that uh, data center up and running at all times. It's very easy for them to put an IT energy efficiency measure on the back burner. And what you can do with getting an IT expert on your side is to counter that with good reasons, technical reasons, why uh, energy efficiency matters in the data center. And the way you do that is you can schedule a free conference call with one of Energy Star's vendor neutral technical advisors. They can get on the phone with you or with your data center manager or with your IT manager. 
um, and they can very quickly, in a short order of time, address any concerns that that IT expert, or pardon me, that your data center manager may have. They can answer their questions that that person would otherwise have to research themselves, so they save your IT colleagues a lot of time. And hundreds of organizations have taken us up on this. It doesn't cost anything. Um, so I encourage you to, to uh, look into this. And again, you can find out how to get an IT expert on your side uh, on the Energy Star website. And I'll show that link again towards the end here. Um, so what do I suggest you do? So you've just spent um, 50 minutes learning about kind of at a high level, what are the ways that you save energy in a data center? Go ahead and schedule a walkthrough with your uh, data center manager or an IT manager with, you could even bring this slide deck and just look for some of the things that, that we've discussed and have a conversation. Again, remember that you have the opportunity to get an expert on the phone with you if you see what you think may be opportunities or if you see a lot of opportunities and need help prioritizing them. And we can help you understand the energy savings that could result from some of these projects that will allow you to build a return on investment analysis, um, which essentially looks at you know what will it cost to implement this change and what benefits will you see. And then I recommend that you share these opportunities. It, it shouldn't just be sustainability pushing for these changes. It should be sustainability, finance, facilities, energy, etc. So let's go to Q&A, and um, I'm going to, we've got about 10 minutes left. While we do Q&A, if it's okay with you, I will just, yes, okay. I'm going to put up what you see here is the link where you can find more information about all of the things that I discussed and my contact information. Um, if you have any questions that we don't get to or any other follow-up uh, questions, feel free to reach out to me at any of these uh, channels here. And uh, Gabriella, thanks again, and I'll turn it back over to you with the questions. Fantastic. And uh, just to make sure, can you hear me all right? Can you hear me all right right now? Yep, I sure can. And is it creating any feedback for you? When I speak uh, and your mic is on, we, I do get an echo. I don't know if the audience does. So maybe uh, when you ask a question, you can hit mute afterwards, and we'll just make use of the mute button. All right, sounds good. Um, thank you for putting up that contact information. I think you've covered a lot of the questions we've received, but um, one that I had here is you spoke about how to get buy-in from your IT team, but how do you get buy-in from non-technical management that might need to approve some of these things? Yeah, so good question. So uh, maybe I'll go back to the slide here. Um, you know, sooner or later, some uh, some of your colleagues in finance or facilities, they're going to want to see you know some numbers around a return on investment, which is step three here. And the, the uh, return on investment is going to really vary uh, widely from facility to facility, and, and it depends on what type of measure. You know, we talk about 12 data center energy efficiency measures here today. Which measure? where it's being implemented, to what extent it's being implemented, um, how many servers, all sorts of, of uh, data. It can be a little intimidating to sort of tease that out, but what we try to do is to be available as Energy Star Advisors to help you um, build that return on investment case. We do provide some information about costs and savings on the website, and I'll bring you back to the website now. Uh, there's the link to the website. And um, we can speak with you about that as well. And then once you get into, you know, getting estimates maybe from vendors, they'll be able to provide you with data on, on this, the potential savings. Thank you. And uh, sorry for the delay, you know, between unmuting and remuting. Uh, so you were talking at one point about the hotspots. And short of taking a picture like the one you showed, what are ways in which people can identify that there is a hot spot that might be causing a problem in their server? Oh, good, good question. So, um, yeah, we don't all have uh, infrared cameras <laughs> on our iPhones, do we? Uh, so, the, the, frankly, the easiest way to do this is uh, to um, have some very inexpensive thermometers that you can place, uh, you know, all around your data center. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit. So, um, these thermometers now, 
um, you can they're literally stickers uh, with various colors on them, like a gradient of color, and they'll show you red uh, where you have a you know a high heat problem. They're very inexpensive, and you can stick them anywhere you want uh, on a server rack. So the places where you should look for hotspots are um, on server racks that are farthest away from the AC unit, at the top of server racks because hot air rises, and anywhere where it looks like air flow may be slightly compromised around the, you know, the tops of server racks. Those are generally going to be the problem areas. Um, you know, obviously, if there's any other uh, obstructions in front of servers, those should be removed. Um, but um, you know, if you have any obstructions that you just can't, uh, you can't move uh, from the fronts of servers, you'll want to check those as well. So, you know, your, your data center uh, manager or server room manager should spend a few bucks and just get a handful of these uh, temperature sensors, put them on the, the uh, racks where, you know, in the locations where, like I just described, you anticipate might be potentially hot spots, and then slowly you can raise the temperature in the server room. We recommend just literally a degree a day and monitor those areas to see if they're approaching an unsafe range. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Mike. Um, one more question I have here. You talked about lots of different options and measures that people can take. Do you have any recommendations on what provides the most bang for the buck? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And, and the, the problem is every data center is different. Um, and it, it really requires kind of looking at each uh, situation on its own. Um, the way that we can help you with that is um, if you do a walkthrough in your server rooms or data centers and think you see some opportunities, generally we can get on the phone with you, one of our technical advisors, and have a conversation where we ask some questions about what you've seen. and you know, almost always we can help you identify the one or two measures that are probably going to deliver the best return. Uh, that's not a very satisfactory answer, and I guess it's a long-winded way of saying it depends, but we can help you figure that out. Um, just generally speaking, I mean, for data centers that have control over the AC, you know, so not all server rooms do. Uh, some server rooms use the AC that the, that um, you know the, the larger building provides. But uh, you know, where where they have dedicated cooling in data centers, cooling is often a really good place to look first because um, you know between raising the set point temperatures, getting variable speed fan drives installed, uh, things like that. There's a lot, a lot of savings. And the, the reason for that is, if you'll remember back to that original pie chart at the beginning of the presentation, so much of the energy consumed in a data center is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. The other place to look first, I'd say, is, is uh, with the IT equipment itself, getting a good inventory going, um, removing those servers that you really don't need. Thank you, Mike. And uh, in the last minute that we have here, one short question. Um, minimum square footage for ENERGY STAR certification of data centers. Is there, is there one? That might stump me. I believe there is, but let's go back to that slide. Um, so I believe this only yeah, this only applies to standalone data centers or buildings that house really large data centers. So the Energy Star rating for data centers really is just for those biggest data centers. Unfortunately, um, it's not for server rooms and server closets, just because they you know those those types of facilities can just be all over the map in terms of how they're cooled, um, you know how they're constructed you know, what's housed in them, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, to answer the question, the, um, the rating system really is just for large standalone data centers. And by standalone, I mean it's, you know, the building, the entire building is the data center. Um, or it's a building 
that may have some other offices in it, but the vast majority of it is a large data center. That, those are the cases where you'll be able to use the Energy Star rating tool.